thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to participate in celebration of anniversary of Professor Shatashvili. Many of his achievements were mentioned earlier in the conference. Today I want to emphasize the role of Samson in integrability and specifically in Bertha Gage correspondence. I think this photo was not shown before. This is a new one. I'm just taking credit. This is all the way, it's all the way. <laughs> Well, but new for the conference. <laughs> it's this, your sister Nana is like, Georgia got talent. <laughs> um, so let's start with nonlinear Schrodinger equation. There is, um, uh, it's first of all, the model has like many, many different names. It's called Lieb-Linear, nonlinear Schrodinger, both gas with delta interaction, and some people call it Tonks Girard Dogas. Um, so there is also se several different ways to write down Hamiltonian. This is the representation in terms of many body quantum mechanics, kinetic energy and delta potential. Um, coupling constant will be positive for this lecture. Later, I will write it in terms of the quantum field, Bose fields, like Bose field kappa, standard Bose commutation relation. Delta is a positive number, which I will interpret later the step of the lattice. So, um, at first, the model was solved by coordinate Batanzats and stayed that way for a long time. Many interesting physical properties were extracted from coordinate Batanzats, but later it was reformulated in terms of quantum inverse scattering method. Um, that's our matrix, which is I squared of minus one permutation, and this is we, lambda and mu we call spectral parameters. Um, so, this is the L operator. And somehow in the original paper, it was written approximately in the sense of the step of the lattice. Step of the lattice was supposed to be small, and the L operator was written uh, approximately with the pre this precision, delta square. But later, we were able to restore all the next orders in the step of the lattice. And this is exact L operator on the lattice. I mean, no corrections. So the step of the lattice and uh, in the under the square root. Rho is a square root of this one coupling constant, side of the side number of particles in the lattice side number j, or low index, and that's mainly modification of off diagonal elements by this square root, but also some correction on the diagonal, this number of particles. So this is exact L operator. This is lattice nonlinear Schrodinger. L operator for lattice nonlinear Schrodinger. It has involution. It has involution. So <coughs> sigma x is off diagonal matrix with uh, Ident with identities on the off diagonal, and then this is dug as a conjugation of quantum operators. And uh, lambda, uh, later I will argue that lambda can be kept real for the purposes of this lecture. <coughs> Excuse me, what is lambda? Oh, um, the coupling constant. No, 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 no. This is a coupling constant which enter Hamiltonian. And lambda is a spectral parameter, which is a new parameter, which was not in the Hamiltonian. This is like artificial new parameter designed in order to solve the model. This is something new which was not in the Hamiltonian, but they appear, you know, the trick of solution. Also, the dimension two by two of L operator was not mentioned in the Hamiltonian. This is yet another auxiliary object, you know, the designed to solve the model. Okay, so th this is entries of uh, this L operator. This is two of diagonal and diagonal, and I can calculate the commutation relation. This is SU2 algebra, representation of SU2 algebra. Um, uh, but spin is negative. Spin is minus two, um, kappa divided by delta, and I'm very happy to present this in the presence of Professor Karczemski, who's somewhere here because he likes negative spin, minus one. So I mentioned minus one specifically. Complex even like better. Complex well, for the purpose of this uh, lecture, it will be negative spin. So once again, kappa is positive. Okay, SU2 representation with negative spin. Um, then uh, uh, quantum inverse scattering method works very similar to the continuous case. So I can multiply L operators in the auxiliary space. I mean, like matrices two by two, row by column, and then. Oh, the entries, the quantum operators in different lattice sites commute with one another. We call it ultra locality. So this product I can write as explicit matrix two by two in the auxiliary space. But A, D, and B, and C are complicated combination of quantum operators, all of this S plus minus in the, all of these lattice sites from one to L. I'm sorry for the degeneration of notation. 
I mean, length of the lattice is also L. Um, trace of uh, monitor matrix A plus D is important, and the Hamiltonian will be extracted later from this trace of monitor matrix by means of trace identities. Uh, this involution still works for the modern derivative matrix, so Daga means Hermitian conjugation of uh, quantum operators. Zero means this is an explicit matrix in this auxiliary space of 2 by 2. And sigma s is of diagonal matrix 2 by 2 and multiplication that auxiliary space. So um, it's easy to invert this matrix. I kind of can use Kramer's formula, but with some shift of spectral parameters. So here, I mean, I can divide T inverse and uh, uh, I mean, can multiply by T inverse, and T inverse will be given by Kramer's formula almost with some shift of spectral parameter. And the determinant also given like AD minus BC with some shift of uh, spectral parameters. So it's like we call it quantum determinant. It's the center of the algebra. It commutes with all other operators actually equal to some function of spectral parameters, which is quadratic function. <coughs> So algebraic betanzat works in the form which was designed by Professor Tartajan with co-authors. Um, and then it leads to betanzat equation, which we shall analyze in a moment. Uh, but the equation, so lambda is those spectral parameters. Later, they will play the role of momentum. Momentum is a simple function of the spectral parameter. And then they're even more convenient than momentum, because if I write two-body scattering matrix as a function of momentum, it will depend on both momentum of two colliding particles. But if I write this in this terms of spectral parameter, then scattering matrix will depend on the difference of spectral parameters. So it's like more convenient pr parameterization from the point of view of study of two-body scattering. Um, so, and then uh, next we have to design Hamiltonian, uh, starting from uh, elevator. There are several different ways to um, construct Hamiltonian on the lattice. The most popular was constructed by Tarasov, Tartajan, and Fadeev. Later I will mention other Hamiltonians. So, this one, TTF, people call it F, well, TTF. Um, the Hamiltonian is written in terms of the logarithmic derivative of gamma function, and this j depend on the local spins. Here is, here is this, um, I mean, uh, this is spin in one lattice side, spin in a uh, neighboring lattice side, and then in this equation everything commutes, in this mm -hmm. equation. So I can, this quadratic equation which I can solve by, you know, standard formula, <coughs> and then, oops. Uh, substitute this into here. So this is famous Taras of Tartajan uh, Hamiltonian, which we shall study for a while, and then later we shall switch to another Hamiltonian. Um, so uh, for spin minus one, specification for Professor Karchemsky. Um, and then the spin minus one, uh, this is um, Bedanza's equation, and this is expression for the energy. Let's study Bedanza's equations for a while. We can prove three different theorems for uh, this better equation. So let's prove the theorems. I don't know. Yes, do I have time for proof of the theorems? Absolutely. Okay, 15 minutes. Uh, theorem number one. Um, this system of equation, first of all, I have n variables and lambdas and also an equation. So for k here, supposed to run through 1 to n, so it's not one equation, it's a system of equations. So theorem number one, if solutions of the system exist, all of them have to be real numbers. So how can possibly prove this statement? Well, I have to study these factors in the right-hand side. So in the right-hand side, I can simple elementary calculation show that the modulus of each and every factor in the right hand side is larger than one only if imaginary part of this lambda is greater than zero. If it's smaller uh, than zero, then it's um, smaller than one. In the left hand side, it's the other way. So if imaginary part of this lambda of this lambda is greater than zero, then smaller than one, and uh, the other way around. So how I can prove it? First of all, let's I mean, consider this set of lambdas. Maybe they're imaginary. Let's pick the lambda with the maximal value of imaginary part. If there are several of them, I pick one of them. Um, and then I plug this in the right-hand side. So in the right-hand side, I will have this difference. This lambda has the largest imaginary part. So the difference actually will have a positive imaginary part, this one. So the models of the right-hand side is larger than one as well as the left-hand side. So left-hand side, if imaginary part 
I mean, it's larger than one, then this means that uh, imaginary part is smaller than zero. So all of this shows that maximum lambda of the maximal imaginary part, um, its imaginary part is smaller than zero. So all other uh, lambdas also have imaginary part smaller than zero. So all lambdas has imaginary part that's smaller than zero. Then I can go through similar consideration, can, can, sit, can pick up lambda with the minimal imaginary part, and then I can prove that all of the imaginary parts greater than zero. So this means that they're equal to zero. So that's like real, right? Okay, so <laughs> I proved is that you know, George Poy was using the same arguments in 1918 19. in his paper on Riemann zeta function. Poy was using Poyer, 19, 19, 19, 19. I will have reference for 1856 later. So we'll, but for the uh, for the different subject, who, who N not about this. Oh, okay. Some other stuff. Okay, so we proved that it's a solution. If they exist, they are real. Do they exist? So uh, take logarithm. Take a logarithm of the Beth equation. So L is length of the lattice. Theta is this a logarithm of the what was left hand side, and theta is um, of the difference is this for logarithm of the former right hand side. So Beth equations famous. So how I can possibly prove this solution? So I want to prove next theorem solution exists and unique. So after I choose uh, integer numbers, so first I pick set of integer numbers which is the subject of the third theorem. Well, the second, let's pick set of integer numbers, this n, and then after we do that, solution exists in unique. So how can possibly prove this? Action, this young, this uh, equation, but equation has young action, has action. So that's an action was suggested by young and young. So theta one is integral of the theta of the previous transparency, integral, and uh, then this is integer numbers, and this is theta integral of those scattering phase. So if I consider extremum uh, of this action, the like derivative of S with respect to lambda, I will come back to this uh, equations, to this equation. So uh, this bit equation has action, which was uh, used in many papers by Professor Shadashvili. Um, so uh, let's prove that this is it's convex. So let's prove that it's convex. Then there is unique minimum. Then solution exists and unique. So let's calculate the second derivative. Second derivative of this is given diagonal element k. This it's positive, right? Because k is small, coupling constant is positive. And this is uh, off diagonal element, which is also with like with a minus sign. So uh, let's calculate quadratic form. So v is some vector, a real vector with real components. So after some massaging, it's equal to L, this k multiplied by the square, and this off diagonal will be combined to this um, square of the difference, square of the difference. So anyway, it's positive for if v is real. So the young action is convex, so unique minimum. Nice. So it's theorem number two, solution exists and unique, given by the set of integer numbers. By the way, um, the determinant of this play will pop up again later when we shall construct um, again vectors of this Hamiltonian, which was mentioned in the beginning. Then the square of the norm of the better wave function is actually given by the determinant of this matrix. Determinant. Um, it was conjectured here first by Michel Godin from Sacle, and then I proved it ten years later. Um, so uh, now the third theorem, which I promised, Pauli principle. Pauli principle. Let me come back to this equation. So Pauli principle, uh, the third theorem about this equation. So third theorem is the following. I can prove that if all n's are different, uh, then all lambdas are different, which solutions exist. But if two n's coincide, then corresponding lambdas, corresponding means with the same index, also coincide. This is not good. If two lambdas coincide, that construction of algebraic Bertanzats will have this b square. And then uh, all these calculations of algebraic Bertanzats will lead to one additional extra equation. So uh, the system of Bertanzats equation will be overfilled, will be too much equations. And this, the third equation, looks like positive number equal to zero. So there is no solution. So if two n coincide, there is no corresponding eigenvectors. It does not exist. So it means that all n's has to be different. Uh, so that's the end of the theorems, and the uh, implication for physics means that the ground state of the Hamiltonian will look like Fermi sphere. It will look like interacting electrons. So all ends will, at zero temperature, will feel some interval, and this will minimize the energy. So I started with bosonic theory, but in the momentum space, it looks like fermions.
because of the Pauli principle. So let's move further, maybe something interesting. Uh -huh. So this is thermodynamic limit. Um, I have this uh, length of the box, total length of the lattice, which I assume go to infinity right now, and also number of particles uh, also go to infinity. So number of particles go to infinity, length of the box go to infinity, the ratio is fixed, density, and then uh, it can be this, uh, this lambdas, solution of that equations, they distributed along some curve, curve described by uh, rho, and the rho is a solution of integral equation. Q is the value of spectral parameter on the Fermi sphere, which people sometimes call it Fermi sphere. And as long as Q is uh, finite, uh, then one can prove that this, the, this linear integral operator, I mean, I can move this in the left-hand side, is not degenerated. So uh, there is a unique, unique solution of this equation. It's uh, somewhat similar to a leap linear equation. For a leap linear equation, I have similar equation, but instead of this one, I have 1 divided by 2 pi. So this is kind of Q deformation of Lee Plininger because I moved to the lattice. So in the continuous, uh, I had this equation, but this, this K was replaced by, was 1 divided by 2 pi. And now in the lattice, I have this K. So these equations, I mean, we cannot solve it analytically. We don't have an analytical expression. There is very simple decomposition when coupling constant kappa go to infinity, the integral becomes small. But uh, at small kappa, this is very, very singular. Uh, and uh, I mean, Lee Plininger has studied right now for small values of coupling constant and the coefficient given in, term, in terms of our own Riemann zeta at odd arguments, which further Smirnov likes so much. This is even more singular at, at uh, small kappa, which we didn't study it yet. Um, okay, so in thermodynamic limit, there is no bound state, right? Because all lambdas are real, no bound state. And uh, any energy level can be interpreted as a scattering state of several elementary excitations. So elementary excitation can be described, uh, well, it has some energy and momentum. So uh, the energy of elementary excitation is, uh, this is uh, uh, original energy, this is chemical potential. And this is integral equation, which we already saw. Uh, later, uh, I mean, as I said, that lambda is not really momentum. This is formal spectral parameter. So momentum as a function of lambda, I will write later, a little bit later. Um, so this is the picture of this elementary excitation. This is my Fermi sphere. So meaning that all the states here are filled in. So I cannot put any more particles into here because of Pauli principle, but I can make a hole. So here I have excitation, which is a hole, and this is like energy. And in, in out, out of this interval, there is no particle, so I can put particle into here. And then <coughs> this is my dispersion curve dependence, dependence of energy on spectral parameter of this elementary excitation. Momentum will come momentarily, so it's gapless. The energy vanish, and then later we shall see that the velocity of sound, sound velocity, uh, is given by the slope of this curve. Well, I have to differentiate with respect to momenta, but uh, we'll do this later. Okay, this is formula um, for momentum, like physical momentum. The, this P0 is a log, this is log of the left-hand side of my bit equations. Theta is a logarithm of the right-hand side, and the rho is something which we saw before. So this is momentum of the particle, this is momentum of the whole, but all of this together describe elementary excitation, give the dependence of energy of, on the momentum of this elementary excitation. This is scattering metric, these two elementary excitation, uh, they scatter uh, and the scattering is elastic, there is only transition and phase shift is given by the similar integral equation. Uh, in the right hand side I pu put this theta, theta actually has a physical meaning of the phase shift in the um, bare vacuum, zero density. And then when I, when I have non-zero density, I have to dress up this phase by this integral equation. So phase shift. Um, v um, is a derivative of energy with respect mo to momentum of that elementary excitation on the Fermi age. And it describes, uh, well, it's by now it's called quench velocity. Quench velocity means many different things, among other things. Um, if I make some local quantum mechanical measurement in one lattice side, then it will cause the entropy wave, and entropy wave will spread with this velocity, so quench velocity. Uh, in, in a moment, I will go to, we'll describe thermodynamics, Young and Young thermodynamics. Thermodynamics has an entropy, thermoentropy, 
But before that, at zero temperature, I have another entropy, which is entanglement entropy, which should not be confused. So first I talk about entanglement entropy, and then we close up zero temperature and move to the positive temperature. So entanglement entropy behaves standardly. So ground state is unique, so entropy of the whole ground state is zero. But there is some entropy in a block of spins. This is quantum mechanical phenomena, right? Because in uh, classical, uh, if I can see the classical random variable, if the total entropy of the uh, classical random variable is zero, then there is no entropy in any subsystem. One can prove the theorem. Quantum case, not so. Total entropy can be equal to zero, but there is entropy in the subsystem. Quantum fluctuations, you know, entanglement entropy. And then, uh, of course, uh, entropy is a complicated function of the size of this block of spins. But for large uh, uh, size of the spin, it's logarithmic dependence with a coefficient one third, and it agrees with safety. It agrees with quantum field, uh, conformal field theory because central charge is equal to one. Rainy entropy, rainy entropy. So rho is a density symmetric of block of that spin. So alpha is some fractional number from zero to one. And then I take this density matrix, rates in the power alpha, take trace, log. This is a rainy entropy. Rainy entropy also depends logarithmically on the size of the block, but coefficient in front of the log depends on that alpha. So this is entanglement entropy. So I mentioned this. Well, Professor Berlin mentioned this in his lecture, so it might be appropriate. So now uh, let's consider thermodynamics. Thermodynamics. In principle, for continuous nonlinear Schrodinger, thermodynamic was constructed by Young, C and Young, and C.P. Young. Um, in here, in the latest version, it's similar. Construction is similar. Also, equation is not it's different from the continuous case. Difference in here, in the in homogeneous, in the continuous case, it was square of lambda square minus chemical potential. In here, I have this my bare energy. That's the one which I saw when I wrote that equation. This integral looks really, really similar to Young Young equation. So this is famous Young equations. There's some notation. So epsilon is the ratio of the density of the holes to the particles. I mean, at zero temperature, I have a concentration of particles for small momentum b minus q. There was no holes, only particle. But at positive temperature, everything mixed up, particles and holes. So the ratio is epsilon. Epsilon also has other meaning at, uh, because this model is integrable. There is infinitely many conservation laws. Uh, this uh, leads to uh, consequences that uh, even at positive temperature, there is a stable excitations which does not uh, decay. And then the energy, this epsilon is actually energy of this stable excitation which exists for positive temperature and does not decay. Um, so uh, thermodynamics, um, free energy, free energy can be described by, well, this answer in terms of this epsilon. I wrote equation for the epsilon. This equation, the, the previous Young-Young equation was analyzed. I mean, uh, the only one mathematical theorem which was proved that if I start iterating this, like in the first approximation, epsilon is given by this expression. And then I put this into here and keep iterating. So this iteration converges, so one of the solutions exists. But it's probably unique, but it's not proven. There is no theorem that it's unique, but one solution exists. Um, so this is free energy, this is pressure, and this is entropy. So, but this is thermoentropy, right? It's thermoentropy of the whole bulk. So it's not entanglement entropy. I mean, it's, uh, thermal entropy also exists for classical thermodynamics. It doesn't describe quantum mechanics. So while entanglement entropy is the difference between classical and quantum, so I should not confuse. Um, so all of this can be done for other values of um, negative spin. So here I decided to uh, deviate from Professor Karczymski and consider not necessarily minus one, but maybe some other number. Everything goes through. This is a better equations. Uh, this is thermodynamics, entropy, everything works. Okay, so this was so far analysis of the Hamiltonian of Tartajan, Fadeev, and Tarasov. There is other Hamiltonians of the latest nonlinear Schrodinger. So I keep our matrix. Our matrix, my our matrix is the same like it was in continuous case, and uh, for the latest, I never change it. It was discovered by Young actually, so I keep the Young term. L operator is the one which was in the beginning. But by now, I want to um, change it a little bit. I make, want to make it different in the odd and even um, latest sites. Well, the purpose of doing this is to get some other Hamiltonian. So 
this is the shift of the specs of the parameter, which is a little bit different in the order and even lattice side. So n, I think it was j before, so I'm sorry for changing notation. So it was j, now it's n, and it's evidently different. All diagonal elements uh, looks the same, but this inhomogeneity also appears under the square root. And kappa now becomes size. Sorry, I just copied from the other paper. So, <coughs> And then later we shall see delta is still like a step of the lattice and this is number of the total total number of particles in the whole lattice set so with this uh, modification of elipirator we can design new hamiltonian this is expression in terms of trace identities so tau is a trace like a plus z of the product of all of this elipirator and this is a special value of spectral parameter where L operator become one dimensional projector. The quantum determinant vanish at this point. So that's the reason I can write this Hamiltonian. It looks even more complicated than Fadi, uh, Tarasov, and Tachtajan. So this T we express in terms of alpha. And alpha is a relatively simple function of the local Bose field. So. Um, this elaborator actually describes interaction of eight laser sites. So people might argue that Fadi if Taras of Tuchtajan is better. Um, okay, so now I'm actually uh, moving to form factors. Um, before that, well, as I mentioned, the uh, square of the norm is given by this Gordon formula, but the determinant form factors in the behaves similar uh, in the continuous and the latest case. So I will kind of explaining. First, I will remind what happens with the uh, form factors in the continuous case. I mean, like they don't exist. The answer is like negative. Um, but I mean, uh, the behavior is similar on the latest and the continuous case. So um, this is some one of form factors. So this J is the side agassi for the continuous case. Uh, this is local density of particles in the x and t space-time points. This is standard canonical Bose um, operator. And the q is number of particles on the interval 0x. So I can take this q and take a matrix element between two uh, better states. This is like one and this is another and normalize it. Um, it's actually it was long story. Uh, first, some determinant representation was written for this. And determinant representation, I mentioned, determinant of the, of the matrix of a large size, the, num the size of the matrix equal to n capital number of the particles, which goes to infinity. And uh, later I will mention the similar determinant representation also exists for the latest uh, nonlinear Schrodinger. Not identical, but similar. And then this determinant representation was studied, and the answer was negative. Because when the lengths of the lattice go to infinity, this form factor decays, goes to zero, as some fractional power. So f is some solution of integral equation. Actually, this is a phase, scattering phase of those two elementary excitations divided by 2 pi. This f. This is definition in terms of the lambdas. This we call it shift function, but it also coincides with a phase shift of two scattering matrices. So the form factors vanish in the continuous. Uh, this is just other form factors also was analyzed. They also don't exist. Uh, this is determinant representation, but maybe it's published somewhere. Maybe it's not interesting to the people right now. OK, uh, so um, this last couple of transparencies, I was explaining uh, problems with the form factor in the continuous nonlinear Schrodinger. Similar problems occur for lettuce and uh, Takeshi Oto from Japan. Uh, he wrote determinant representation for some operator or for latest nonlinear Schrodinger. The operator somehow has correct continuous limit. And uh, maybe I just come back. Uh, so and then uh, Karl Kozlovsky. Karl Kozlovsky he analyzed the thermodynamic limit of this determinant of Takeshi Ota, and then it also goes to zero as a fractional power of the length of the lattice, actually the same power. So this is more or less the end of what I was going to say about nonlinear Schrodinger on the lattice. Maybe the last transparency that similar calculation can be done for sine Gordon. This is continuous sine Gordon. And then um, continuous sine Gordon was solved by algebraic Bertanzas and quantum inverse scattering method by Professor Tahtajan and Fadeev. 
but we have uh, our own latest version which is interesting by itself but maybe maybe it's a good time for me to stop my lecture and wish happy birthday to professor Shotashvili again and he he you was my best student so that's the end of my lecture <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe just some references. Mm -hmm. uh, the main reference here. The main reference is this, and this was our inspiration. This was Professor Shatashvili related to dimensional topological uh, gauge theories to nonlinear Schrodinger to continuous nonlinear Schrodinger. This was inspiration for our work. Okay. So if you look at Sein Gordon. Do you, uh, on the lab, this, do you see something of the costal thalus transition with your algebraic methods? Uh, I didn't see uh, that phase transition. Um, I mean, uh, our contribution was kind of a boring mathematics. I mean, beta ansatz for sine Gordon, I mean, this relativistic model, there is one Feynman diagram in divergence. For beta ansatz, we have to learn how to. Uh, uh, make ultraviolet renormalization. And here, um, for say and Gordon, for specific, like for rational values of coupling constant, there is an like anisotropy parameter, which is coupling constant. For the rational values, we can <laughs> compactify the local Hilbert, Hilbert space. We don't have to have this infinite dimensional Hilbert space, which we had for latest nonlinear Schrodinger, but we have a finite dimensional. Uh, the, I mean, f dimension is equal to the denominator of this uh, fraction. So. We just use it more like for mathematical justification, everything is rigorous. But short answer is no to your question. <laughs> questions or comments? There is another uh, I learned some time ago, a lattice version of this delta function. Yeah. A Schrodinger operator. Ablovitz logic? There's two people in the United States. Uh, they live in the Midwest. One is Ablovitz, that's the name of a person, and Logic is another person. There is author of that paper, I, I was told, is uh, some uh, Dutch person living in Brazil. Oh. It's the James, the James. Uh, I don't know. Well, I don't know that paper, pay, but Ablovitz Logic, you know Ablovitz Logic. So Ablovitz Logic has another discretization of nonlinear Schrodinger. I mean, we kind of insist on ours because in uh, their case, uh, our matrix is different. So our matrix depends on the lattice step. No, and in our case, in our case, like going from continuous to uh, lattice is like changing the representation of the same algebra, right? The algebra is given by our matrix. So we just keep our matrix, change representation. So we think like this is intelligent way to criticize, to uh, discretize. But uh, I mean, Ablovitz logic, they change our matrix. Sorry, and you was meaning, you, you, your question was? That one is actually this uh, second order differential uh, operator with delta function potential is replaced by some difference equation, which in the limit becomes that. Well, I mean, if uh, wave function there is uh, what's called hal litwood polynomial. Yeah, I don't know. If I, if I take uh, nonlinear Schrodinger and replace the second derivative by the difference, it won't be integrable, so one should be careful with this. I mean, it's just straightforward discretization. We'll just keep and then this will be a problem because there will, the phase transition will appear when I send a latest step to zero, then it's not integrable, then turn integrable, and this is kind of uh, problematic. So it's not regularization, it's like falsification. Right. I think that <laughs> I don't know that paper, so maybe you show me that later. Well, maybe I should also mention uh, that uh, on the latest nonlinear Schrodinger, uh, the model is equivalent to XXX with negative spin, which has multiple applications to a latest gauge. You know, Professor Karchemsky and Lipatov and Fadiev, but also um, Kazakov in his fishnet has this XXX with negative spin. So the latest version has direct application to four dimensional young males. Well, talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I also have a question just about you were saying that when, let us say, going to infinity, this lambdas become uniformly distributed with a certain density. Uh -huh. Did Young and Young or you can it be proved rigorously? I'm just oh, curious. actually, I'm curious. yes, <coughs> yes, like yes, yes. Short answer is yes, because remember. Well, maybe I can answer your question if you permit. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so remember when I wrote better and equations, I had the three theorems. The third I kind of crumbled, you know, I didn't say clearly. 
but the third one was like this. I have logarithmic form of that equation. I have this n. So I can subtract this equation and I can estimate the difference between two neighboring lambdas in terms of the difference of n's from above and from below. So when L, uh, total length of the base, go to infinity, I can prove that the difference between lambda go like 1 divided by L with some finite coefficient. So we can prove that the difference 1 divided by L, and then this is the basis of the proof that rho exists. Okay. So the answer is yes. It's not from uh, Young. And Young is like in my book. Okay. Young didn't prove did, did, he didn't prove you this. Did. The, the, I did. It is in, it's in the textbook. Okay. Any more questions? Thanks again. Thank you.